A warm welcome to all the journalists and participants with us in the room today, and as well those following us on live stream. I'm Jeremy Jurgens, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum, and I have the pleasure to moderate this session here in Davos on speeding up the road on the road to net zero. First, uh, let me introduce our participants today. To my left is Fatih Birol, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Franz Timmermans, Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal with the European Commission. Catherine McGregor, Chief Executive Officer, NGA Group. And we'll be joined shortly by Secretary John Kerry, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate of the United States of America. Now, before inviting the panelists uh, to join in, I'd like to just share a few words of context. The world's facing two major and connected crises. We have the worst energy crisis since the 1970s, and at the same time, the climate crisis with the window to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees closing quickly. Both of these crises are challenging to address at the speed and scale needed for governments, companies, and others. One challenge cannot be solved while neglecting the other. They have to be solved together. Earlier this month, the World Economic Forum released the 2022 Fostering Effective Energy Transition Report, which highlighted that global energy systems are now under pressure from all sides, sustainability, affordability, and energy security, following many shocks and too slow progress on the transition. The report also underscores that we now must supercharge the energy transition to deliver sustainable, affordable, and secure energy for all. The topic for today's press conference is how to speed up on the road to net zero emissions and address the global energy crisis. How do we find win-wins, avoid that solutions to the energy crisis slow down progress on climate action? I'd like to invite brief perspectives from our distinguished panelists. After the panelists, we'll have time for Q&A uh, from journalists. And so with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Fatih Birol to begin. Uh, many thanks, and uh, great that uh, WEF uh, decided such a, a press conference together with uh, very distinguished uh, colleagues uh, with me today. Now, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I believe the Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, led to a major energy crisis. In my view, this is the first global energy crisis. We had the uh, oil uh, press, uh, crisis, oil crisis in the 1970s, but now we have uh, major problems in terms of oil, in terms of natural gas, in terms of coal, as uh, Russia the country that uh, invaded uh, Ukraine uh, was uh, only a few weeks ago number one oil exporter of the world, number one natural gas exporter of the world, and the major player in the uh, coal uh, uh, markets. As a result, uh, we are uh, seeing that the global energy markets are going to a major uh, turmoil. Uh, energy prices are skyrocketing, and as such, they are putting a huge burden on the global economy. Inflation is surging in many countries, including, including uh, giving some uh, signals of possible uh, recession in some countries and uh, beyond. So as such, we are seeing that the energy security is becoming a key uh, issue in many countries' agenda. and. Uh, Countries are providing immediate responses to loss of Russian oil and gas in the markets, understandably so, but uh, it is uh, important that the, address, the response we give to Russia's uh, uh, um, invasion of uh, Ukraine and resulting energy questions do not lock in our energy future uh, in a way that uh, we are chances to limit the temperature increase 1.5 degrees is diminished. 
because I see uh, that the, some of the measures are uh, definitely right in order to address uh, the, uh, the, the resulting loss of Russian oil and gas to compensate this, but some go uh, beyond, and we may well see that if the measures are not taken uh, uh, rightly, the, our energy future is locked in, a fossil fuel uh, future, and we may lose our chances uh, to reach our climate goals. Maybe I stop here. Great. Thank you, Dr. Brill. Uh, I'd now like to invite Executive Vice President Timmermans. Thank you very much, and it's great to be back in Davos. Uh, a bit strange to experience these high temperatures, but uh, great, great to have this opportunity to talk again about these issues. Let me start by explaining briefly why we launched uh, Repower EU last week, which is our answer to the need to uh, wean ourselves as quickly as possible from imports uh, of gas and oil from coal, gas and oil from Russia. Um, I think there is a Europe before the 24th of February of this year and one after. Things have changed, have changed profoundly, and even if the war would end tomorrow, the change is permanent. Uh, and one of the effects of this change is that we can no longer depend on Russian fossil fuels and that it is best for our security and our prosperity and our future uh, that we make sure we no longer need uh, Russian uh, oil and gas. Now, three components of our plan. First of all, we need to do much better in energy savings. You know, the cheapest energy is the energy you don't, you don't use, and we could do much more, both at the level of industry, at the level of the private sector and at the level of individual citizens, 440 million of them, to reduce our energy uh, consumption. And we've proposed a number of measures that could lead to that. The second element, obviously, is to rapidly speed up um, our uh, transition to renewable energy. Uh, we will uh, put a special emphasis on rooftop solar because that is the quickest response. Uh, if um, uh, we could convince all our member states to do what we propose, 25% um, of Europe's energy uh, electricity, uh, pardon me, electricity will come from rooftop solar, which is a huge amount. Uh, and it will also help us address, I think, the most thorny political issue today in many European countries, which is extremely high energy prices. Um, we will also be um, working to speed up permitting, which has been one of the main issues slowing down the transition. We will create so-called go-to areas, where you do once a permitting for a whole area, and then you don't need to do it for individual pro uh, projects. That might reduce the time from seven to eight years to hopefully one. Um, that would also already help this energy transition. And we will want to double the production of biomethane, which is also a huge uh, potential resource that would also give new opportunities for a struggling European agriculture sector. So that's the second pillar. But the third pillar is also inevitable, which is to diversify uh, uh, energy resourcing of fossil uh, fuels. We cannot make the first and the second elements I spoke about the only pillars because that doesn't work for the immediate. We will have to replace some of the fossil fuel with other fossil fuel and so we're looking to sign L LNG contracts and pipeline gas contracts around the world. Um, I hope we will get the mandate as European Commission from our member states to do the negotiations on behalf of all the member states uh, I now see sometimes um, unfortunate uh, negotiations from one member state and another member state driving the price up um, uh, because if, if I were a producer, I would also see uh, how much I can get out of that. That's not smart. I hope we can decide to do these negotiations together. And the offer we have for the countries is not just to buy their LNG but also to um, develop structural plans with them for the coming hydrogen economy. So you do do things at the same time. You solve a short-term problem and you create a long-term uh, 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 relationship in a worldwide network, which I believe will be coming of green hydrogen production. Uh, um, that will, will be the basis, I think, of all the areas where uh, electricity alone cannot solve the problem. And also the, the way to store and transport um, the excess electricity that will be produced uh, from solar and wind in countries that do, do not need all that electricity. So I think hydrogen is, is part of the long-term answer. Now, this is, this is the Repower EU. I hope we will get support for that. It's uh, approximately 300 billion euros, uh, which sounds like a lot of money, but it isn't if you compare it to the 100 billion euros we're spending every year on Russian oil and gas. If you could spend that money on something that's future-proof, that's a lot better. The final remark I want to make before I end is 
yes, you mentioned the crises we have, but I think it's not all the crises we have. And I particularly want to insist on the life-threatening biodiversity crisis we also face. Nature is in trouble. And where all our uh, citizens are now very much aware of the climate crisis, and they want us to address the climate crisis, the same sense of urgency does not exist yet on the biodiversity crisis and the poor state our nature is in. The food crisis we're facing now is partly caused by uh, the, the war, is partly caused by climate change, but is also caused by the biodiversity crisis. And if we don't take a holistic approach to these crises combined, one of them will literally kill us. Uh, so we need to have a holistic approach, including the biodiversity challenge we have. Thank you. And thank you for that healthy reminder on the wider set of crises we are facing here. I'd now like to pass to uh, Catherine McGregor, uh, CEO of the NGA Group. Yeah, thank you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So um, we had uh, these massive challenges uh, facing us already with this energy transition that needed to fulfill the decarbonation agenda and the affordability agenda. And now we have the security slash sovereignty agenda, which uh, makes indeed you know, the challenges even larger. So three key things for us at NG, we are a very large energy utility company. I just want to leave you with three things that we are working on to help putting a a piece of the solution. The first one is diversification. The second one is acceleration. And the third one, which is coalition and partnership. So the first thing is obviously diversification, diversification of supply, uh, making sure that we are uh, uh, buying the gas that is needed in the short term from a range of suppliers, um, leveraging the European infrastructure, both from the import transport and storage point of view. We are also uh, have strong conviction that the future energy mix of any country and for Europe for that matter has to be balanced and therefore there has to be also a diversification of technologies because really just common sense do not put all your eggs in one basket is our belief. Therefore electricity, of course wind, of course solar, wind onshore, wind offshore, but also gas will have to play a, re, a, a strong role in this energy transition to make sure that we continue specifically on the affordability route. It's a very narrow path indeed. Second point is around acceleration. So obviously acceleration in renewable, it's uh, renewable today, it has the merit of being produced locally. There are dependencies on supply chain, of course, on technologies, whether it's PV or whether it's wind turbines, but still, once it's installed, you have a true produced here energy, which is a fantastic uh, uh, element of the solution to the sovereignty uh, challenge that we're facing, affordability and low carbon, of course. So we are accelerating. We are now at a four gigawatt per year uh, additional capacity of renewable power. Uh, at NG, and this is to 2025. We have a target of 50 gigawatt and 80 gigawatt to 2030. We are on pace. About half of our growth capex goes to renewables, so we are very um, motivated and and uh, and actively working on that. We are also looking and thinking about how we can make those renewables more acceptable uh, by society. It's a big challenge, you know. Uh, Franz Timmerman mentioned the. Uh, the permitting, a lot of the permitting difficulty comes also from a poor appropriation of citizens of this energy and this project. So we're working, and in France, we have innovated with the introduction of, of actually a Bureau Veritas jointly developed label, which we've called TED, to make sure that the renewable project that we are developing follow a strict methodology against nine criteria, namely climate, nature, and local stakeholders which is so important to make sure that projects are successful. Uh, we're also, of course, very bull bullish in, in renewable gas, so it's biomethane and hydrogen. We have a target of being operating about four gigawatt of electrolyzer green hydrogen, uh, which is going to be a big, big chunk of the, the response. And my last point, which is around coalition and partnerships, the challenges are so big that we cannot do anything in isolation. We need, of course, government support, uh, we need a partnership, we need to work together with suppliers and customers. And here I just want to mention the first mover coalition, which is really trying to address the chicken and egg issues, challenges, by making sure we can aggregate the demand 
for green technology, whether it's green power, green steel, so that we can really give strong demand signals in order to get uh, the new economy uh, kick-started. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Catherine. I'd now like to pass to uh, Secretary Kerry, the um, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate of the United States. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here with my friends and colleagues who have been working on this for some period of time. So it's critical to acknowledge that events in Ukraine have raised a number of questions and challenged people's thinking to some degree. And I think hopefully here today uh, and in the next discussions uh, here at the World Economic Forum, we can, we can be very clear about several things. Uh, we should not allow a false narrative to be created that what has happened in Ukraine uh, somehow uh, obviates the need to continue forward and to accelerate even what we're trying to do to uh, address the crisis of the climate. Um, yes, there has to be a resupply to Europe of gas that has been lost in uh, the cutoff from Russia. But as Fatih Birol knows and understands and the International Energy Agency makes clear, there are ways to provide that gas, uh, ranging from uh, using shale, which is to market, uh, doesn't require a whole massive new infrastructure and drilling, to channeling the venting and the flaring that is wasting literally an amount of gas that is equal to the amount that Europe uses from Russia. And if you begin to also deploy some of the technologies that are available today at greater amount, which Europe is doing, then you begin to deal with the demand issue. Uh, so. What we can't do, obviously, which some people are already pushing for, is the notion that it needs a massive build-out of a whole uh, recommittal of the kind of infrastructure we've had in the last century uh, in order to meet this crisis. We can meet this crisis and meet the crisis of Ukraine and the energy crisis of Europe and still deal, as we must, with the climate crisis. And no one should believe that the crisis of Ukraine is an excuse to suddenly build out the old kind of infrastructure that we had. Uh, we have to be more creative than that. We have to be much smarter than that, uh, given the stakes. Emissions have gone up in the last year. Uh, they've gone up 6%, some 36 billion tons of CO2. And coal use has gone up about 9% the last year. Now, everybody here understands that to keep an economy moving, and we must, and to not wind up in deficit, energy crisis, uh, it may be necessary temporarily to do something uh, that we don't, all of us, really want to do, but we may have to do temporarily. But if we do what we know we can do with respect to the deployment of new technologies, uh, and if we approach this thoughtfully with respect to the rapid uh, investment in and deployment of new technologies, which the IEA points out, there are about 44 of those technologies that will have a massive impact on our ability to deal with the climate crisis and provide energy, but which do not contribute further to the climate crisis itself. So. Note what happened in Glasgow. In Glasgow, 65% of global GDP made commitments that if fully, if fully implemented, means they would be keeping 1.5 degrees alive. There's another 35% of the world's GDP that didn't yet make those decisions, but which we want to encourage to try to raise their ambition. But the fact is that the International Energy Agency evaluated all of the promises made in Glasgow and concluded that if they are fully implemented, that would provide 
a temperature rise over the next, by 2050, of 1.8 degrees. That message is not that, okay, 1.8 becomes acceptable. That message is that we can win the battle if we bring the other 35 percent on board and if we accelerate the process by which we are implementing new alternative and renewable choices for our energy production. So I'm encouraged by that. And the First Mover Coalition, which is a group of major corporations around the world that are making decisions now to pay the green premium in order to produce green cement or in order to have sustainable aviation fuel or enable to build a carbon-free ship for shipping. They are doing those things. And they're doing them because they know that that will accelerate the transition and accelerate our ability to be able to meet the crisis. So I think we should be hopeful and optimistic that if we make the right choices here, we can win all of these battles. We can do what we need to do with respect to Ukraine. We can do what we need to do with respect to the climate crisis. But we cannot be seduced into believing that this suddenly is an open door to going back and doing what we were doing, which created the crisis in the first place, which will not go away unless we approach it thoughtfully and with the other options that are available to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. I'd like to now open it up for questions. Uh, please identify yourself and also indicate to whom your uh, question is addressed. Uh, Ms. Wong. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Wang Qing, a uh, reporter from China, uh, Jianmian Xinwen. And I have a question to uh, Mr. Kerry. Uh, we know that last year in Glasgow, you met with uh, Mr. Xie Zhenghua from China, and uh, you've made uh, the joint declaration and a few action points. And so I wonder, uh, so uh, back at, uh, uh, at this moment, if you would evaluate the progress that you have had uh, since then, how would you evaluate it? And uh, my second question, to Mr. Timmermans, and uh, you mentioned that now uh, Europe is facing this transition to renewable energy and is looking for global partners. And I wonder what is your prospect, you know, in this context, uh, in terms of the China-EU collaboration? Thank you so much. Well, um, I've had several conversations virtually with uh, my counterpart Xi Jinping, and uh, this morning we met here in uh, Davos. We had a very good meeting, very constructive. Uh, we are working to finish the, the finishing touches on the working group that we've created with experts working from both of our uh, countries who will contribute to the dialogue. And we are meeting again in Berlin at the uh, G7 meeting in a couple of days to bring working group together. And obviously we hope over the next months uh, to be able to accelerate our joint efforts. Uh, China signed up in Glasgow to issuing this year an ambitious national action plan for methane, and that's critical. And we agreed to work together to accelerate the conversion from coal. Uh, we also agreed to work on deforestation. Those will be the subjects of the working group that we hope to uh, close out in the next few days. But um, I'm very optimistic, and I think that Xi Jinping and we will both be on a panel shortly. Um, uh, we would both agree that uh, it's imperative that we work together. This is not a bilateral issue. It's a multilateral, global, universal, and existential issue. And not working together is simply unacceptable uh, for both of our countries, but most importantly for the rest of the world, for all of our citizens. Thank you. Yes, I also spoke to Xi Jinping last week uh, online, and I will be meeting with him in Berlin tomorrow night. Um, I think um, uh, our talks are focused mainly on uh, both uh, the issue of mitigation, how do you reduce emissions, and adaptation, how do you make sure we bring together the funds that were promised to the developing world uh, for the adaptation, and uh, we're looking for ways to make that happen together. Uh, we're also looking, I'm also looking for ways to increase uh, the acceptance of an emissions trading system in China, which is something that uh, China is working on and I think is very promising. And of course, we're also always very interested in knowing uh, what the transition to renewables actually means in China, because China is massively, massively investing in, in renewables 
uh, and we want to know how and, and where and what this means uh, for China's energy mix. Uh, because, you know, um, China is responsible for about a quarter of emissions uh, globally. If we can really, really make agreements that reduce those emissions, that would have a huge impact on uh, global emissions. And uh, I also think it will be, have a huge positive impact on China's future economy if they can shift away from uh, fossil fuel to, uh, to renewables. So I think, I think this is, like John says, a global issue where I believe China has always shown a leadership role. Uh, there would have not have been an agreement in Paris uh, without China playing a leadership role there together with the United States. There would not have been uh, an agreement last year in Glasgow if um, there was not a meeting of minds, uh, especially between the U.S. Uh, and China, uh, and that we could sort of come to an agreement that was acceptable to China but was very much forward-looking. So we need China in this, and but also China needs to show responsibility in this, and uh, Mr. Xi Jinping is someone uh, that we can really, really work with. Great. Thank you. I'd, um, we're at the time limit, but I'd like to take two more questions, if it's okay with the panelists. I'll take those together, uh, Mustafa, and then the gentleman in the white uh, shirt. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, my question is for Mr. Kerry. Uh, I'm Mustafa Al Rawi from The National in Abu Dhabi. Um, as we move forward, we'll have COP27 in Egypt, COP28 in the UAE. With speeding up the path to net zero, what role can Middle East countries play in, in helping the global effort and working together with everyone? Middle East countries can play, and, and some of them are playing, a critical role at this point. Uh, UAE stepped up and hosted the first ever Middle East climate uh, conference, which had 11 countries come together, uh, a group of them oil and gas producers, uh, and they all signed on to an extremely forward-leaning uh, communique, which they are now pursuing and following up on. UAE, for instance, has a very large solar uh, deployment. Uh, they're exploring rapidly um, uh, green hydrogen and other ways to be, and they're investing in other countries and helping with their transitions. Uh, India is a prime example where you have a 450 gigawatt commitment by Prime Minister Modi, which is a uh, 500 now, which is very significant. But they're, you know, Middle Eastern countries are, are already engaged in the effort to accelerate that deployment. Um, Obviously, uh, flaring, uh, ending flaring, uh, Iraq, for instance, other countries, a flare still and vent, uh, that's a real challenge because methane is so much more destructive than CO2. We must stop those practices and obviously plug the leaks of methane that are occurring in too many parts of the world. Russia has a particularly heavy leakage challenge. So um, I, I think that any oil producing country that begins to step up and indicate their acceptance of, a, of the reality of a need to build a, for a transition is a critical message to the rest of the world. And the UAE and uh, other countries in the region have done that and are doing that. So uh, we just, we announced uh, Project Prosperity, uh, which is a combination of Jordan and the UAE and Israel uh, building uh, 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 solar power output that will feed into Israel while Israel is going to help produce um, a major desalinization plant capacity for Jordan. Uh, and there's a synergy in that, not to mention that it helps build a foundation for countries to begin to think about each other and work with each other very differently from past history. So we look forward to uh, a leadership from the region uh, and obviously it would help uh, to have uh, some greater production at this point in time in order to deal with some of the challenges of inflation uh, and rise of price, uh, particularly on gas, for a lot of citizens around the world. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last question here. Uh Hello, um, Cornel Dalbeek from the Belgium newspaper, The Standard. I had a question for Ms. McGregor. Um, how do you see the current nuclear power plants in the road to net zero? Um, especially in Belgium, because we are closing down, as you know, or we're trying to reopen them. So how do you see their future? Look, I, I think as a general comment, um, I think nuclear is part of this uh, diversification of energy mix and can be a solution. 
uh, NG as a private actor, as you know, has not uh, dis has decided that nuclear operation was not going to be a priority. So we are right now following what is uh, currently in Belgian law, which is to uh, phase out nuclear by 2025 with the discussion, specific discussion on two nuclear with the Belgian government. These discussions are ongoing, so obviously we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do our role there. Great. Thank you. With that, I'd like to close this uh, press conference and uh, thank our panelists and also all the journalists uh, following here today. Thank you.